At 7 o'clock on a July morning in 1999, young citizens of Tokyo began to gather outside a shop in the Akihabara district. They were here for a chance to meet two of the creators of Lunar, Toshiyuki Kuboka, the artist who designed the Lunar characters and the world they inhabit, and Kei Shigema, writer of the Lunar scenarios. Lunar Eternal Blue is, for me, it was my very first game when it was released for Sega Saturn. The characters are very good. Each heroine of the series is very cute. That's why I like them. The world view and music and illustrations are very pretty. I can see that they didn't skimp on anything when they made it. I can see it in the game. Which scene was the most difficult to create when you were working on each game? Quite a number of people came to see us, and this was the first time for me to have an opportunity to meet in person with the Lunar fans. I believe this was a very valuable opportunity that I was afforded. Even though it was planned rather quickly, there were so many fans that came. In addition, they spoke of Lunar in such enthusiastic terms, so I was very happy with it. I also noticed that there were more girls than boys present, which I did not expect, and that made me feel good. <laughs> Though I had to get up early to come here, it paid off, and I am really, really happy to have this. <laughs> this is Lamina that Mr. Kuboka drew for me. One of the things that really just blows me away is the fact that the U.S. version of Lunar 1 was imported back into Japan by fans in Japan. Eternal Blue is in the genre of a role-playing game. There are animations in the event scenes, and those animations are very high quality. And the story is also very efficient in terms of appealing to the players. I think Eternal Blue is one of the greatest RPG games to utilize animation that was ever made. This is a game, but this game is a work of entertainment. Therefore, I believe that with a game like Lunar, which was well received in Japan, there is no way that it won't be well received in America. You know, when everything comes together, you know, the, the art, the music, the storytelling, the characterization, you know, it creates a world that's just magical and it sucks players in. I think that's why Lunar is uh, the hit that it is. It was very, very popular in Japan when it was released. It's been released in like four different versions, uh, both one and two. And then when it came to the U.S., it has gained momentum with every release. Every release has been more than the one before. The most enjoyable thing for me as a producer is to recognize that people from all over the world will respond to our games and say, for example, it was great. Creative people like me prefer fan mail to money. <laughs>
In that plot, the original Lunar One characters, who had become older, would do an adventure with the new characters. This created the problem of having too many characters to deal with. So, in the middle of our planning, we changed the story to the present one. The flow of the story is one where the heroine, Lucia, never associated with a human being before. But by encountering Hero, she experiences human emotions, one by one. So we deal with this rather difficult theme. At the start of the game, Lucia comes down from the Blue Star. She's basically an alien who happens to speak the language of Lunar. And by the end of the game, she's grown. You've seen her grow into a real person, someone who feels emotion, someone who feels love. The way they handled the bath scenes in Lunar 2 was to make a comment on Lucia's growth. The first bath scene is uh, Hero and, and Ruby, and then Lucia walks in. And Lucia is completely unassuming. She walks in naked, and she's like, well, you know, there is a girl's bath, but I want to take a bath with you. No sexual overtone on her part at all, but she was just completely unaware of, you know, what was going on. But by the second scene where she's bathing in the spring and Hero walks in on her, the reverse situation, she's embarrassed about her nakedness. When she hears somebody's there, she covers up because she's embarrassed. And it's a, it's a great, great commentary on sort of... The previous animation, Lunar 1, was more for purposes of effect. For example, a huge, mysterious castle appears in the script, etc. There were many scenes that had a significant visual impact in Lunar 1. But this time, the animation was more drama-oriented. There were many scenes in Lunar 2 that 
showed the inner struggle of human beings presented through the images displayed. Japanese animations are done differently from those done in American animation. In American animations, they make the dialogue first and adjust to that dialogue. We call this pre-scoring, matching the dialogue and writing it into a plan that is given to the animators. The drawings are then done to match the dialogue. However, in Japan, animators construct the images and then, according to those drawings, voice actors will add their part while watching the animation. First, we create the drawing based on the original artistic rendering. We then use the computer to paint the color into the drawing. This is called Paint Man. Like this, we paint by hand many sheets one by one. As this drawing shows, character itself does not move. When we want to move only hair, if we put hair and character together, we have to make many drawings. And there's also a danger that the character may look a little different. We therefore make hair by itself. When we film it, we put the two together. It will look like the hair is being blown by the wind. The graphic data created on the computer is rendered using Macintosh software. At that time, the background is filled in with a watercolor drawing. The director, Toshiyuki Kuboka, was originally an animator. When he looks for beauty in hand-drawn art or detailed artwork, he turns to watercolor paintings. Subtle variation in shade of color or thickness of paint layer, the subtle accents created by the touch of the brush, these things cannot be done quite well enough with the computer. First, when the camera moves from one end to the other of this overlay, we slide it slightly to give it the 3D effect. The floor here is where the character walks. In front of that, we place this one, and then we place this one on top of that. The screen itself is moved while the character is placed in the center. This produces a pretty good 3D effect. This is the regular method we used here for this type of animation. We scan it with a scanner, and on the computer screen we add various adjustments and effects. After that, we place the character drawing on top of this background. We also adapt 3D CGI for use in these works. This 3D CGI consists of light wave images. Using this, we make a composite that results in two-dimensional images. We can also take a hand-drawn picture and render it in a light wave image. There is a scene where the blue star is captured by the camera as it approaches the Earth. And then at the end, it enters into the tower and captures Lucia. That was something we wanted to do from the time of the Sega CD or Mega CD. At that time, however, technically, it was a bit too difficult for us to do. So this time, since we were able to do that scene, we hired a special design expert to help with this scene's effects, and we devoted a lot of time to it. The most difficult scene was at the end. We used the CG there also. A scene of a spectacle was very hard. Since this is a game, the scenario keeps changing throughout the creative process. We therefore have to rewrite the scenario and the Kante to match the game. The spectacle scene towards the end was added onto the existing art as if there is a summit with fog around it. And when we reached that point, we discovered another summit yet to be reached. This is Destiny, a battleship built for the land. It has a fin part that allows it to advance, to move forward by moving the fins. The modeling is very complicated, so when we complete one, we will use it for many different scenes. When we first make the original model, it takes a considerable amount of time. However, once made, to actually run the model through its movements does not take that much time. Natural things such as ocean, clouds, smoke, etc. are difficult to create. To make them look real is a challenging task no matter how much experience you have in doing this. Nature is difficult. Gonzo went nuts with the CG stuff and they really did 
come into their own, blending that with the, uh, the traditional hand-drawn animation so that you get this really wonderful mix of 2D and sort of 3D CGI that looks like 2D hand-drawn. <laughs> music accents the playing of the game. Without music, playing the game is so empty and lifeless. Music expresses the emotional climate. There are a lot of pleasures associated with composing music, but at the same time, there is a lot of pain as well. When I started working on these projects, I started to get gray hairs around here. However, I enjoy creating music. Especially matching the music to the animation scenes is enjoyable. Usually most composers want to use their time composing music for movies or popular songs. So I feel we were very fortunate to have someone like Mr. Iwadari, who understands music, but who was also willing to participate in the making of the story, and expressed his opinion and created the music to match the story with a lot of emotion. As for Lunar Eternal Blue, the image was somewhat more grand and mysterious. We used the piano as our main instrument and added orchestration to it. I felt that it required a more worldwide sense and I therefore included ethnicity to the music to some extent. Among the characters who appear, there is a girl named Jean who is a warrior. The place where she lives is called Carnival. It's a fun place. We wanted to give some sort of specific character to this town, and we therefore included percussion-type instruments like the tabla, which is from India. And on top of that rhythm, we thought that adding guitar and violin would make it more fun-sounding. Also for the villages, we included some Indian music using the tabla as well. In the orchestration, we use Debussy and Ravel type of music. I personally feel that we also have Sibelius included in it. By using the influence of Sibelius, we try to express the cold weather scene. Even though it is Northern European, I felt that Gypsy was also in it. So I tried to include an element of Gypsy in it as well. For the sounds that are heard in the game, we use the internal sound of PlayStation. We use the sound designer too, and we also use software that is specially designed to be used for the PlayStation, that converts the sound for use in the PlayStation system. If I click this, you can hear the sound of the bass drum or cymbal or tambourine. This is the sound of the oboe. We just put each sound in a timeline. Then we will mix it at the end. For example, like this. Originally, this music would be produced by an orchestra. And then we have to convert that into this small 200 kilobit memory. This was the hardest point, and it demanded a lot of work. My company does Lunar's game programming and graphics. Also, at the completion of the game, we finish it in CD form. There was a huge quantity of graphics. For graphics, we used about 30 to 40 people, and the rest were project planning and programming. There are people who work on backgrounds and those who work on the characters, and they each make their own products independently. But then we put them together, and we see how well they complement each other. The hardest thing involving my work is that it doesn't leave me much time to sleep, especially as we approach the end of the project. First of all, in the morning, I don't get up because I'm already up. I've been up all night and I program and program and eat and program again. Since we made the game in such a way that everybody can complete the game, I don't see any player having any problems. But if you get hurt, it is best to go back. That would be the quickest way. If you push yourself too much, you may end up being defeated even by a rather weak enemy. I don't want the players to win quickly. I want them to enjoy the story. And I believe it is much more enjoyable to take your time in playing the game.
tremendous amount of things that you have to do when you're localizing a game, which is sort of more than translation, because translation sort of implies just text only. We changed the audio from really low sampling stereo to 38 kilohertz, which is almost CD quality mono. So you get much higher quality sound. Um, maybe change the music around, um, in increase the memory card system. We almost always have to do that. Then uh, we make programming changes. We'll add DualShock usually. Uh, analog is like a given immediately. Well, the save system sucked because it only allows three save games per two blocks. And it also checked both cards before you even start the game. So I changed that so that it would only check the card once you tell it that you want to load or save. And I'm trying to get a minimum of 21 saves per memory card. First thing you do is add analog support. Because now with the DualShock controllers, you, you could don't bust your thumbs, you know, moving diagonals and stuff, because you have that nice, you know, smooth analog stick. To make the animations look better, I changed the resolution from 256 by 224 to 320 by 224, which makes all the artifacting really small, so it's hardly noticeable. With Lunar 2, I mainly do all of the graphics for the manual, all of the packaging, and a few of the in-game graphics that we had to change that were kanji or Japanese characters. Ta-da! Congratulations! You're a winner! Our philosophy of translation is different than virtually anybody else out there because rather than do a literal translation, we try to do the translation, find out the spirit of what was said, and then write in that same spirit in English so it feels natural. The Japanese writers are fond of puns, uh, of, of rhyming words in Japanese, but that doesn't translate, of course. You know, you'll, you'll get a joke that translates, Pickle, I thought you said baseball card. So we'll put something else in there that's very American um, that people will get and laugh at and have a good time with. Uh, I know I shouldn't look a gift horse in the mouth, but... What kind of cheesy pop is that? If you just want to go with the main narrative, all you have to do is accomplish the major events in the game. But if you're looking for a more enriching, rewarding experience and you want to know more about the world of Lunar, you can go talk to more people and find out more stuff. And that's the cool thing about Lunar, is it has so much text that if you really want to take the time, you can find a bunch of stuff that the average player isn't going to get. Your world is in grave danger. I must see Alfina immediately. Another major thing, obviously, is that we uh, record the voices. We do all the voiceovers again, we remix all those in. When we decided to do the remake of 2, and we were getting down to recasting, I kept all the characters from the first one where possible. One exception we made was with Hero. Come back, Lucia! I wanted a hero who sounded a little bit more assertive when he was yelling, a little bit deeper, a little bit older, but not too old. Wait! Actually, Ashley Angel, who was the voice of Alex, the, the lead character in uh, Lunar 1, uh, he was a friend of mine, and uh, he introduced me to Victor, and uh, we hit it off, kind of went from there, and I had a small part in uh, Lunar 1. But Hero does have a quite a big emotional range, because he, he gets angry when he is exerting himself, uh, especially in the opening sequence. He cries at the end, and uh, that's, that was difficult to do. you got to have a Mountain Dew, and you, you know, get your throat kind of going. <laughs> We have a monitor in here and kind of do the lip sync and we have to get it in with the inflections with movements and stuff. I should have brought Grandpa's chisel. This is way harder than I thought. Ugh. Not bad. That was okay. That was pretty damn good. I play Lucia. She's the princess from the Blue Star, related in some way, shape, or form to Athena, the goddess. She's just sort of a sweet little girl who wants to help, but she can be angry when she gets angry. I must go, Hero. Lucia and Hero, there's a point where they could say goodbye. I remember making it, um, just trying to get the real emotion in, in there and making it realistic and not sort of a fake goodbye scene. I play Ruby and I play Jean. Ruby is the little annoying pink dragon. She is kind of Hero's sidekick. When I heard her at first, Although it was spoken in Japanese, I could tell that she was kind of a wench or whatever and kind of stuck up. And um, so then I could just go from there and kind of apply my own wenchiness or whatever to that character. If you can't shut your eyes, I'll do it for you! You have to look down at the script and then look back up at the screen to make sure you're staying right with the movement of their mouth and look up and down. I'll keep talking and, and the voice or the mouth will stop on the cartoon or vice versa. So we need to add or subtract uh, syllables. So it's a lot of, a lot of fun finding, 
finding words that mean the exact same thing that are longer or shorter. My name is Lamina Alsa. You have just officially passed. Lamina is the lord of this vein or this world. It's like the magic guild and it's not really a big deal anymore because it got blown, at, blown to bits in the game before. So to her, it's a big deal. It's fun, but it's exasperating sometimes. I mean, it's a lot of fun, and it, but you know, the things where you have to like fake laugh or fake cry, that's kind of hard or when you do one line over and over and over and over again. And sometimes one line can take an hour, especially with me. <laughs> I always start to laugh. I don't know why, obviously. You know, but Victor's really good about um, helping you, you know, taking a break or playing a CD that makes you laugh. You have to add your own, kind of your own personality into the character while playing a different character at the same time, if that makes sense. When we're doing the voices, there's some parts where, you know, you think, well, maybe I should do this or that, and Victor's really open to you know, maybe what you want to do instead. And you just kind of work with what sounds good, really. I'm able to speak the part of Ruby basically in my own voice. And Bill somehow, I don't know how he does it, makes the voice higher. Huh! Oh, great! Don't tell me you're hearing voices now! I'm working on a computer system that has a Pro Tools editing system. And in there, I have pitch shifting capabilities. I can reverse the sound. I can, I can do just a myriad of different things to that sound to make it sound like all I want. The sampling rate on the Japanese version of the game is so low, so I have to recreate uh, all the sound effects, humming crystals and everything. Well, there's 30-some animations, and in the more complex ones, there's, you know, there might be 100 sound effects or so that are you know, individually placed and, and filed. And many times, a particular sound by itself is not enough. I'll, I'll take one sound, and I may layer two or three other seemingly unrelated sounds, and when I get done, it all works together. We have a crew of game testers now because Lunar is such an overwhelming project. We had to, we were going crazy. I was losing people to mental institutions left and right. I am, and to a large degree, a lot of the people here are perfectionists as far as the way they want to see the game run and look and be presented and such. So we'll constantly try to improve and improve and improve and improve. And at some point, you just got to say, stop. You gotta ship this game, let's get it out the door. The numbers that I was given from the different retailers at this show are just huge for Lunar 2. Well, everything we do with all of our video games is very special and very unique. And with Lunar 2, we're doing more than we've ever done before with any video game. The way we're presenting the game to the consumer exceeds even what they do in Japan. And they're the nuttiest gamers of all as far as what they get for options. And so we're, we're bringing that to the US audience because we're nuts. Mr. Shigema's other nickname is Shower Writer. Everything he writes includes a shower scene. Hi, Ben. Yeah, Lunar's a great experience because of the fact that I have to burp right now and I'm going to slip it here sometime very soon. The whole time I'm talking, I have another one on deck. And it'll probably slip out, I'm sure. Buy more games. <laughs> Are you taping? No, okay. <laughs> oh, great! Don't even talk! <laughs> Was it good? My name is Kathy. <laughs> Victor says I'm a gold take out for it. Gold take. And so being insane fortunately has helped me. Young, adventurous. Horny. Oh yeah, he's definitely horny. <laughs> oh my god. I haven't done it yet. Yeah, I'm trying to think. That's a big question. Lying. I'm not telling. <laughs> Oh, what a tangled web we weave when we deceive. <laughs> <laughs> and she doesn't have any clothes on. That's, that's like everybody's favorite part, especially Victor. Oh, yes. Whoa, that sounds bad. I probably can get fired for that. <laughs> Dang! Well, at least we get good screw ups. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, no more. Let's enjoy.